what is going on guys, it is Coded Red here. Welcome back to the Advanced Spigot Coding Series for 1.16. This is episode eight, and I got an awesome video for you guys today. Now, the next few videos are gonna we'll be talking about persistent data containers. And these are an amazing thing in Spigot that lets us hold data in item stacks, blocks, entities, players, and more. And that data stays throughout a reload, throughout a restart, whenever the server shuts down, that data will stay. Now, this is really, really useful for when you have a data system, such as a file system or a database that holds some data that you don't want the owner of the plugin or the user of the plugin, I mean, to edit. Things like saving locations of blocks. And like our last episode, we went over a map that saves the ID to the uh, link of the PNG, whatever. That kind of stuff we can save in a persistent data container and remove the file system for us. Now, what I mean by this, I did code a real quick example. So in the plugin we're coding today is whenever we have a chest and we place it down, this chest is locked. And we kind of, my chat's a little cut off, but it says chest locked. Now I'm the owner of the chest, so I can go into the chest and place things in there like that map from the last episode and go ahead and place things in there. But my other account can not access the chest. You do not have access to the chest. He can't open it. And he most importantly cannot break the chest. So this is a persistent data container. If I were to uh, reload the server, you'll see that he still can't open the chest. And if I were to restart the server, you'll see that he still can't open a chest, but the owner of the chest can open it. Now, this is a really simple example. This is really, really easy to code, but it does show you guys how persistent data containers work through blocks. That's the main focus of this tutorial through blocks. Now it's very similar if you are using item stacks, such as what's in my hand or entities and players. Like I said, I will have a separate tutorial for those things. So without further ado, let's go into the code. All right, to start off, I went ahead and I created the project already. The project is called private chest. I went ahead and created the main package, which is me.codedred.privatechest, the main class, which I called private chests. And then I went ahead and I created another package, which is empty right now, which is the listeners package. And I also created the plugin.yml to show you guys what's inside. There's nothing special. I did, however, create a plugin manager right here so I can go ahead and register the events later on. And as well as the plugin.yml, I made an API version of 1.16. This is all really basic things that you guys should know how to do by now. Start off where to go in our listeners package, go ahead and create a new class. This class I'm going to call chest place. And you can probably guess it. this is going to be our event that takes place when we place the chest. So we're going to say implements a listener at the top because this is an event. We'll go ahead and import that listener. Like I said, this is a very simple example to how to use persistent data types. There is much more advanced things we can do, but I do like this example because um, a chest locking system is pretty widely used on economy servers. So we'll say add event handler public void on place. It's going to be our block, ooh, block place event event. Go ahead and import all of that. And inside of here, first off, we need to check, are they placing a block that's a chest? So if event dot get block dot get type ooh, not temperature type does not equal material dot chest then let's return we don't care about them next up this is gonna be a very important one so like i said person data types are all very similar however when you're dealing with blocks we're dealing with a thing called tile state and i'll explain this later on but event dot get block uh, get state. So we're getting the block state and we're checking if the instance of it is a tile state. And what I said here with this exclamation mark, I said, if it's not, so if it's not instance of a tile state, let's return. Well, we're basically checking here in this if statement, we're checking if the block can hold a persistent data type. That's what a tile state does. Tile state 
has it's a uh, home doesn't really have much it has one thing and that's the persistent data container so we're just checking if our block can hold it so if so let's keep moving on and like i said it's so simple guys next up all we need to create ooh, let me move down a little bit first up we need to create our tile state which i'll call state cast it tile state and what we're saying is event dot get block dot get state. This is why we do the check up here because we don't want to cast a tile state to the block state if it can't, you know, become a tile state. But once we have that tile state, let's go ahead and create our persistent data container. I'll call it container set equal to state dot get persistent data container. Go ahead and import that. Oh, make sure you're spelling it right. That's the T. All right, and then once you have that, we need one more thing, and that is a namespaced key. I went over these before, but we're gonna create a new spaced namespace key. And to create them in 1.16, you need to pass in two different things. You need to pass in instance of a main class and then the name of your key. So I'm going to go ahead and do it like this. I'm going to say private chess, which is the name of our main class dot get plugin. And I'm going to say private chess dot class. Go ahead and put a comma there and I'm going to move it down the line and I'm going to put in the key or the string of private chess. Go ahead and import that. Now this is a custom key. This is unique and it's also very important. So in our next event, when we check when the player is opening the chest, we check if they have this key of private chess. Now this can be whatever you want. Like I said, it's custom. Uh, you can put your name there, whatever, but it's also very important. So make sure Whatever you set it as, we go ahead and grab it as that as well. All right, so once we have the tile state, the persistent data container and the namespace key, we can finally start setting stuff. So container.set, as you can see, we need to pass in a namespace key, but we already created that. So you say key, arg1 will be persistent data, why can't we send it to here? Persistent data type dot, and here is where you can see what you can add. There's a lot of different things you can add. You can add byte, byte array, double, float, integer, long, short, string. And what we're adding here is a string. If you do get this little type argument, go ahead and remove it. And then arg2 will be what string we're adding. So think of container as our chest. So we're setting our chest we're giving it this private chest key we're setting a string because we want to give it a name and what the name is is our player who put the chest down so event dot get player dot get unique id dot to string but it is a string so now the chest that just got placed has a unique a unique persistent data type of a string that is our name so now in our next event, we check it and say if the name equals that name, and if it not, we cancel it. So just like that, we are actually all done, but very, very important. Once you set something, let's make sure we actually update it. So state.update. And once you update it, then the block is all good. We can go ahead and add a little, nice little message here. Event I get player, send message of chest locked and there we go our event here is done let's go ahead and create another event and this is the chest open event i'm gonna go at the top here type implements listener can we import that that's event handler public void on open and this is actually gonna be the player interact event, event. Go ahead and import that. And what's really nice 
this is such a simple plugin. So we can just go ahead in this event and go ahead and just uh, copy everything from the key up. Copy that, go into this event, paste it in. And the only thing you're really going to need to change is the get block to get clicked block. Clicked. And then clicked. And then before I also, I also like to add this one check dot has block. So if it isn't a block, let's just return. All right. So we're saying on this player interactive event, if it is a block, let's keep going. If the block is a chest, let's keep going. And if the block has a tile state interface, let's keep going. Next up is the three things we created before right here. And the only difference here is we're not setting anything. We are checking if it has something. So if the container dot has our key and right here is our persistent data type dot string. Again, remove the type argument if you get that. And here I'm saying return. And I do a lot of these if not checks. So if it doesn't have our key return, it was also really nice here. If it does have a key, you can go ahead and check for multiple persistent types. So if you have our key of our private chests, we can go ahead and set the owner and set the amount of chests that guys owned, or you can set an integer, a double, whatever you want, a float. And you can have multiple things set under this key, which I really like. However, we're checking if the key has a string. So if it doesn't have a string, that means that chest is not locked. So we can just return and we don't care about it. However, if the chest does have a string key, let's go ahead and say if event.getPlayer.getUniqueID.toString dot equals ignore case. I'm gonna move down a line here and I'm gonna say container.get our key and again our persistent data type dot string and once once more i'm saying yeah okay so if so i lost train of thought here if our player so if the player who's clicking on the chest let's get their unique id if it equals the UID, UUID that's in the container, let's go to return, because that means they can open the chest, let them open it. However, if it does not equal, let's go ahead and say event.setCanceled to true, and let's say event.getPlayer.sendMessage, you cannot do this, or you cannot open this chest. That's a little better. And boom, that is it, guys. So, so, so simple. Go ahead and create a state, a container, a key, set it like this. Make sure you update it. This is important. Once it's updated, we can go ahead and check if it has a key. And then if it does have a key, let's go ahead and get the key. And just like that, our plugin's done. Let's go into the main class. And let's make sure we register these events. PM.register events, a new chest open and then arg one will be this and we'll go ahead and copy this line and set it just open this will be just place all right once those events are registered i'm gonna go ahead and run this plugin on my server and see how it works all right now on the server i'm gonna go ahead and place a chest you'll see it says chest locked there i'll go ahead and put something in there why not put that map in there and then on my other account, we'll go ahead and try to open this chest and you'll see it says you cannot open this chest, the same message that we put in our code. I can't even break the chest, I can't do anything. However, my other account can go ahead and do whatever they want with that chest because they own it. And what's really nice is I'm gonna reload the server. And you can see, I can still open this chest. Ooh, ooh. And this guy still cannot open it. I'm gonna do a real quick test, uh, test right here. I'm gonna restart the server. All right, now with my server fully restarted, we will see that you still, ooh, whoops, 
Still cannot open this chest. You can't open this chest and Coated Red can still do it. I really do hope this tutorial made sense to you guys. It is such a simple plugin. However, it is such a simple, you know, idea. Go ahead and add, like I said, this person's data container to item stacks, blocks, entities, and players, and probably even more. That's the only things that I've ever done it with. And it can really make your life so much easier. How much easier is it to do that than a file system? About a hundred times easier. I really do, like I said, hope you guys enjoyed this video. And if you did, please like, subscribe, and I'll see you guys in the next one.